I'll s and turn around and wave to everybody. We're still waving. The next thing is announcements. Does anybody have any announcements? Last chance to get your Christmas Around the World tickets today after uh, church in the lobby. Uh, $10, this is for women in our church. Um, the men will be serving us, so it'll be a nice change. And um, Thursday is our evening meal and program. So if you're interested in a ticket, I'll be in the lobby afterward. Good morning. The youth are going to be caroling tonight, and so um, their youth director is not a good singer, so we need some help. We have some that have been ill, so if um, anybody wants to come caroling um, to some people, our, our uh, members that are at home, uh, feel free to come at five and join us. Um, and if there's any youth that are out there that want to come at five and sing, I, I know I need a lot of help. I cannot seriously sing. Um, and then we will meet again, and then on the date's going to be in two weeks, and it's a fun, fun Christmas party. So if you know any youth that would be interested, do you know the date? I can't. 18th. 18th. The 20th was sticking in my head, and I knew that wasn't right. So yes, December 18th will be our next one, and that's just going to be a really fun Christmas party. So please, if you know any youth that want to join us, tell them to come, and I am encouraging them to bring their friends, because it's always more fun with a friend. So thanks. Today is also 4G Sunday, so uh, the bucket's in the back. Uh, if you want to participate in that, you can. If not, we will quiet our hearts and minds for the lighting of the candles. Please stand if you're able for the call to worship. Prepare the way. Deck, Deck the, the halls and light, light the candles. candles. Prepare the way. Open, Open the, the doors, doors and sing a song of hope. Prepare the way. Make space in our hearts for a new kind of love. Christ is coming. Prepare the way. You may be seated now as Joyce and Arlene and Cindy come forward for a special litany. I will wait for the sky to clear. I will wait for the plot to thicken. I will wait for vacation to arrive. I will wait for snow to fall. I'll wait for dinner to be ready. I will wait for you to be confident. 
I'll wait for my great-grandchild to walk. I will wait for the leaves to change. I'll wait for the dust to settle. I will wait for the lab results. I'll wait for Christmas to arrive. I will wait for a lot of things, but I will not wait for peace. This world is rampant with division, walls, grudge holding, and self-doubt. I do not want to be a passive bystander in this division. We do not want to be passive bystanders in this division. So today, we light the candle of peace as a reminder that we have a role to play. May the, the desire to sow peace kindle in us like a light in the darkness. Amen. Please stand as we sing hymn number 216. Join me in the prayer of confession. Creator, Creator God, God, not, a, not day a day goes by when you do not invite us to be peacemakers and advocates, listeners and good Samaritans. Not a day goes by when we are not asked to be a friend to a stranger and a neighbor to those in need. Not a day goes by when we are not asked to be the people you call us to be. And yet, day after day, we lose sight of your hope for this world. Forgive us for walking a different path and grant us the strength to prepare a new way 
your way here. Gratefully we pray. Amen. With the affirmation of God's love, you are a forgiven people. Amen. Let us sing together, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, in our hymnal number 218. Well, good morning. Today, our scripture is about, is about a man named John the Baptist. Have you guys ever heard of him before? Yeah. No. Okay. Have you heard of Jesus? No. Okay. Jesus had a cousin, and his cousin was named John the Baptist. Now, John was a very strange-looking guy. Does anybody know what he looked like? Can the big kids help us? He had long hair, that's right. And he ate locusts. He wore funny clothes. He ate locusts. Do you know what a locust is? It's a bug. He ate bugs and honey, and he was really hairy, and he wore funny clothes. And he was Jesus' cousin. 
And Jesus' cousin, he went out into the middle of a really big river, and he said he was preparing the way for Jesus. And so he was asking all these people to come and be baptized. And so he was taking their heads, and he was dunking them in the river and bringing them back up. And he told them that they were forgiven. And it was a big deal. Not just because he was baptizing them, but because he was a pretty strange-looking guy, and he had a pretty strange message, and people were coming all over to receive it. So uh, Jesus' cousin was a really, really important person in the story today, because during the, the weeks that we lead up to Christmas, we talk a lot about preparing the way for Jesus, just like John did. Is your hand up? Are we just, oh, we're dancing, I see, okay, sorry. That's okay. So John and Jesus were best friends. Do you have cousins? Yeah. Do you like to play with them? Yeah. Are any of them your best friends? What? Are any of them your best friends? Your cousins? Yeah, some of them. Yeah, so cousins are really special, and John and Jesus were very, very close. And he liked to help Jesus. John really liked to help Jesus. They were... Um, they were best friends ever since they were in their mommy's bellies. They were in their bellies at the same time. So when their moms would hang out and the babies were in the belly, they would kick and play with each other. And that's so cool. Yeah. It's really important that John worked to make love and forgiveness for everybody. So he was helping Jesus prepare the way, and we have to help prepare the way for Jesus to come. So that's why we're learning about John today. Will you pray with me? Okay, let's clasp our hands. God, we thank you for John the Baptist and Jesus who teach us about love and how to make hope, peace, and joy acceptable to, accessible to everyone. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you all can take a treat and head back to your space with your families. Join me. Will you all join me in a word of prayer? Comfort. Comfort, O oh my people. In times of exile and displacement, the prophet Isaiah boldly proclaims that the Lord is coming and comfort will be found in the midst of the wilderness. As we spend our weeks in preparation for the coming Prince of Peace, we are in lament for our siblings who find themselves in unfamiliar places and far from the comfort of safety and freedom. We lament. But we also boldly recall Isaiah's prophecy that grace can be found in the wilderness, that in the midst of our wandering, Comfort is our promise as God's people. We thank you for the prophet Isaiah who has reframed grief for us so that we can move from a place of loss to a place of joy. The Prince of Peace is coming, and we have been told the signs. God will feed the flock like a shepherd. God will gather the lambs in her arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The peace that will come is peace for all people. The peace that is ours is a peace of comfort and safety. The peace that changes our lives is one that unites us as God's children 
and has us put ultimate authority in the loving hands of God. Amen. And now I turn your attention to the presentation of tithes and offerings. Each week, our church takes up a collection of your resources so that we can do ministry in this world. We ask that you would give with the generosity of a peaceful God, and may his reign be in our hearts this season. The church will now accept your gifts. Let us pray. Our God, architect of this world and all others, we know you had a vision for all your creation to dwell together with the creatures of the air, earth, and sea. You long for us to live in respect and with one another. We give this morning understanding that we have denied you that desire. We ask you to help us use who we are and what we have to heal, this abused and broken world. In Christ our Savior, amen.
please rise for today's scripture readings if you're able. Our first reading is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you will find this on pages 595 and 596. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of the wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see and decide what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide for equity for the meek on the earth. He shall struck the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his weight, waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lay down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatting together and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together and the lion should eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weakened child shall put on his hand on the alder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The next scripture is from Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And this can be found on page 836 and 837 in your pew Bible. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, for I am telling you, the axe, the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every, root, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His willing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. Thank you all who had a part in today's worship service and for everyone that came uh, and celebrated uh, Lori and I's Christmas party yesterday. It was a good time, a lot of fun, and we're very grateful that we got to spend um, some quality time with you all having fun. So whether it is your first Sunday here or you've been worshiping here your entire life, you are indeed welcome in this place and we are glad to have you. This is the second Sunday of our Advent journey, and it is dedicated to the principle of peace, which has been a huge part of the Jesus story from his birth to his death on the cross. The arrival or expected coming of the Prince of Peace in Jesus' time was long overdue. I imagine for them it was such a far-fetched an idea as it would be for us today. Our text has a wild-looking man crying out a wild message from the wilderness. John the Baptist with his camel's hair and leather belt going out into the desert to cry out a message of forgiveness was an odd a scene and one 
that has us all wondering which was more odd, the message or the appearance of the one delivering it. Together, they tell us that something about the preparation to follow Christ is going to be unorthodox. The coming of the message, the delivery, and the vessel are all pretty strange. And yet, John's response is pretty incredible. The people turn and come to him from all over. They hear a man who is not a king or a religious leader speaking with authority. He tells them, come and repent and you will be forgiven. For a people who had to purchase their forgiveness and make sacrifices to the temple, this radical message was quite refreshing. It was direct and it was open for all people in a way that repentance and forgiveness had not been before. John was also not affirming his own power or his own authority, but directing people toward Christ. While he called the broken to repent and be baptized, he told them of a new path, a new authority, which would bring with it more power and grace than anyone had ever seen. He preached, and they responded. We are just a few short weeks away from the magic of Christmas morning, where we creep from our bedrooms to the Christmas tree to witness symbols of love and affection, beautifully wrapped boxes waiting for us to open. We have been shopping in stores trying to think of a special or meaningful gift to surprise our friends and family with. We have been attending Christmas light shows, concerts, planning holiday parties, and relishing in the camaraderie that we feel and cherish during this time of year. All of this preparation is done with great love and great care. We all want something new and bright and special. We want all the love of Christmas the gift of God's own Son to be real for us and to feel real for us. As a congregation, we work together to make the Advent season special by honoring traditions of the past, singing some of our favorite songs, and spending time with each other. It is easy for us as a church to get caught up in this sentimental picture of a beautiful baby with loving parents in a cozy-looking manger. It's not so easy for us to believe that this trip to the manger will be different from the last. And to allow our God to establish in us a new repentance and forgiveness. We get comfortable in the message of the coming Christ child and we forget how disrupting it really, really was. The baby would be called King of the Jews establishing Jesus as ultimate authority instead of the state and its rulers. The Christ child had a cousin preparing the way by creating access to forgiveness for all people. Forgiveness was only in the hands of the religious elite, and it required sacrifice and payment to the temple before you could be made clean and pure in the eyes of God. And we may scoff and say, but no one can restrict forgiveness that way. But then, yes, they could and they did. Then the religious leaders were believed to be the only connection for people to the Creator. So if they said a price stood in the way of your salvation, people would very seriously suffer great loss to make their offering. The proclamation of John the Baptist threatened the financial gain of the religious elite. If forgiveness could be given freely, then why would people go to the temple? Why would they pay their tithes and offerings or by sacrifice? The baby in the manger established that when given an opportunity to put flesh and bone on divinity, it came to a couple of common birth with a scandalous pregnancy. God did not come with jewels and crowns and money and power, but to a day laborer 
and his fiance in a smelly cave. God came sending messages to the lowly shepherds, not the religious leaders. God came and a light shined in the darkness, promising peace to war-torn nations and forgiveness to people who for thousands of years had been declared unworthy of it. And the breaking in of Christ was not first cried out from palaces, but from the deserts where the lost and exiled people seeking peace of country, peace of mind, peace and security heard the good news of repentance for, for Christmas and claimed it for themselves. Back in the 1800s, it was common practice for churches to use communion tokens to congregants. They would issue these tokens after an examination was passed, a declaration of faith made, and a final approval of the ministers and elders had to be given before one was considered worthy to come to the Lord's table. To be denied a token would make you an apostate. These tokens were so important to church members, many would request that they be buried with them. Alexander Campbell of the Campbell Stone Restoration Movement and founder of the Disciples of Christ Christian Church got fed up with this sort of elitism within his own religion. And at one gathering service for communion in front of all the ministers and elders, who had evaluated and deemed him worthy of communion, Alexander, sick with the thought that so many of his friends and his colleagues had been restricted from the table, took his communion token and threw it on the plate, handed around. He refused to take the communion elements and announced that these tokens were not tokens of communion, but of separation. The founders of the church and the believers from the beginning have understood that God desires access for all people, ultimate freedom and dignity. They, through their Christian practice, affirm the call of John the Baptist preached in the wilderness that forgiveness has come and it is for all. As we prepare the next couple of weeks for Jesus to break into our lives and to make things new, let us ponder what true peace is. Let us reframe how peace and freedom look in our own lives and in the lives of the community around us. In the book, I Shall Not Hate, a Gaza doctor's story, uh, a Gaza doctor's journey on the road to peace and dignity by Isildin Abuelish, he states, at the borders of consciousness, there is a feeling that every stranger, anyone unknown to us, is an enemy who poses a threat. And this impression is present in the crypts of our souls like a localized inflammation. Ask a healthy Jewish person if they would share a room with a Palestinian, and the answer is usually no. Conversely, a healthy Palestinian is apt to shudder at the thought of sharing a room with a Jewish person. However, if they both become ill and are getting medical attention in the same hospital, it becomes acceptable to share a room with anyone as long as their health needs are met. Illness has now become a common thread between them. They suddenly have a topic of conversation that shares the same concerns, fears, and family involvement. They may even take advice from each other, and who knows, maybe even keep in touch afterwards to see how the other is doing. We all need to search for the causes of our failure in the human journey to peace and discover why we are not happy, satisfied, and secure. The cause is inside us, not outside us, in our own hearts and minds. Hate is a chronic disease, and we need to heal ourselves of it and work toward a world in which we eradicate poverty and suffering. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich from hating each other. 
Talking is good, but it is not enough. We must act. People are suffering and dying every day. The smallest action is more resonant and crosses more boundaries than any words. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Friends, now is a time in our preparation for the coming Prince of Peace where we must understand that repentance and forgiveness are not individual acts, but involve our whole community. Peace looks like supporting justice for all people by speaking boldly to family and friends, community, politicians, and religious leaders. You can support foundations that do peacemaking work. You can volunteer for humanitarian organizations. You can vote regressive politicians out of office. You can do so many things that make the peace of Christ a reality here and now. Why wait when you can have repentance for Christmas? Father Richard Rohr said, Only converted people who are in union with both the pain of this world and the love of God are prepared to read the Bible. With the right pair of eyes and the appropriate bias, which is from the side of the powerless and suffering instead of from the side of control and power. This is foundational and essential conversion. The Greek word metonia, poorly translated as repent in the Bible, quite literally means to change your mind. Until the mind changes the very way it processes the moment, nothing changes long term. Be transformed by a renewal of your mind, Paul says in Romans, which hopefully will allow the heart to soon follow. God can't wait for peace this season, and we are committing ourselves to the journey. May God lay aside our fear and direct our attention to what we can be when we repent of our idle waiting and turn toward peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We gather at this abundant table in anticipation and in desire. We anticipate the way God's breaking in will change us and we desire a deeper relationship with God and with our church. We celebrate the hospitality and welcome of a creative and creating God who equips us to serve this community through Garner United Methodist Church. For the many ways GUMC uses their gifts to bring God's vision to fruition, we give thanks and we celebrate together at the table with our siblings in Christ Jesus. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their unending hymn.
the kingdom of God will draw nearer to us. Now we draw nearer to you, God, remembering Jesus' act of love and reconciliation at a simple table with simple elements and an open invitation. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in an upper room. He took bread and blessed it, broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, pouring it, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus, we offer ourselves in love and discipline as a holy and living sacrifice. In union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. For the spirit that has breathed newness into this life of the congregation, we give thanks and praise. May that same spirit continue to guide and direct our ministry and our lives. We pray and praise these things in the name of the creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our communion stewards can come forward at this time. The table is set. Come and share the Lord.
Let us stand as we're able in body and in spirit to sing together hymn number 2085 found in your Faith We Sing book, He Came Down. people of peace. Let peace live in your heart and share the peace of Christ with all you meet. Share peace by acting out of compassion, not fear. Share peace by listening to a different narrative. Share peace by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share peace. As you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share peace and hope with all those you meet. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 